It is a great morning to fly to the edge of space. VSS Unity on our final flight. The payload we're setting up is to validate this really new exciting technology in space of computed axial lithography. 3D printing in outer space. You remember, NASA sent the code for a wrench to be 3D printed on the International Space Station so the astronauts can use it. But that isn't this story. This is using computed axial lithography in microgravity or no gravity to print things all at once. The team at UC Berkeley put together a space 3D printer, something to go aboard the Virgin Galactic spacecraft and go up here and 3D print some stuff and take a look at what it made. Recently, I was at UC Berkeley and I got to see the machine that would actually go on to the Virgin Galactic spacecraft and dive deep into the tech and how they're building it. And I can't wait for you to see. Check it out. We're at UC Berkeley. This is Taylor. You've seen him before. And this, the hottest new gaming rig in front of me. No, I'm just kidding, actually, right? What is this? This is, and I mean this seriously, a space printer. A space 3D printer. And this will print things in outer space. In outer space. In outer space. In outer space. Yes. In outer space. This... It's a space printer. <gasps> yeah, so last time you saw our, our big 3D printer that we tested in zero gravity, and we basically shrunk it down made it into basically a brick. It's super rigged. It needs to survive some tough environments, some tough rocket environments, um, into a space 3D printer. You're working with NASA on this, right? We're working with NASA. This is a NASA-funded project, and we're working with Virgin Galactic. What's going to happen is we're going to put this in a special locker, and it's going to go up to space for a couple minutes, come back down, and it's going to do a lot more than our other printer did. It's going to print in space. In space. It's going to print in space. It's going to post-process in space, and it's going to post-cure in space. It's going to do all of that. All of that. All of that. It's going to begin the printing process autonomously. It's going to wash the part and post-cure the part. And when Virgin Galactic comes back to terra firma, it will have four prints. Yes. Complete. Just done. done. Ready to go. It's all autonomous and it's all battery powered too as well, so, which is cool. So you could bring this out into the desert if you wanted with you and print with it. it it's meant to be a self-contained full printing processing system. Do you commonly think about bringing a 3D printer to the desert? Do you not? I mean, once. No more adventures. This is a more complete package than what we saw mm -hmm. at Open Source with Cal. Mm -hmm. Computed Axial Lithography. I love that acronym. And it it's hardened because you're working with NASA and obviously it has to survive doing something like that yeah. way, way high in the air. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was the first step in actually getting to space printer? Was it, was it imagining the frame or was it having to shrink components or sourcing new things? Good, good question. You start with kind of what your end goals are. You, you call these basically mission requirements. So we set our mission requirements mm -hmm. is that we wanna have four different printing vials and then we wanna post-process and post-cure all autonomously. And so those are the most high level requirements and then everything kind of trickled down below that. So by autonomously, you mean on earth, you're gonna hit a button on a radio transmitter and it's gonna go, or is this going to reach a certain altitude and go, or is the pilot hit a button, or are you on a radio on earth, like hitting a button? No, it really is autonomous. We, we programmed it and it has basically detection on there to know when it's floating in space. And then it triggers the full experiment. So it's all really self-contained by itself. Nobody's pressing buttons. This printer is just ready to go. It's all designed to just 3D print in space by itself. None of us touching it at all. That's amazing. Right? That's actually, that's, I mean, I can't even think of a consumer-based 3D printer that I would trust to autonomously detect zero G and then just <laughs> kick off and you've done it with what I believe to be a, a far more complex set of uh, circumstances. There was, there was a <laughs> lot of different systems. So like in kind of the engineering terms, we had fluidics, we had optics, we had structures, we had electromechanical, we had computational, we had experimental. All these different concepts had to be squeezed into this box and it was a lot and you're like fighting against these different concepts to all have them in balance because they all need their certain things to function. With this being hardened for the journey mm -hmm. and for the mission, the mission, right? It, there's a set of autonomous things that happen. There's, there's certain steps that have to happen. And so if I think about the computed axial lithography process, you've got a projector, you've got the goo, you have the spinny thing, and then the, the post-processing of it. Mm -hmm. So then, okay, uh, the projector. What did you do in here to give a projector? Yeah, let me let me tilt this around so everybody can see it. So we have. Oh, you can move it around like this because this is like. Oh, it's built like a brick. It, it's, yeah. it needs to function in any direction I put it in, and it needs to be able to stand a lot of forces. 
So right over here is we have our projector. It's this black box. And essentially, this one projector splits into what we call a kind of our optics housing here. You, you can't see it. It's enclosed. And then splits the image in half. So if we have a rectangular image, now we're getting basically two squares out of it. And then the two squares um, on each side go into uh, what's called a beam splitter now. So now it refracts half of the light upwards and half of the light forwards. So it's still the same image, but half the light intensity. And what that okay. allows us to do is we have only one projector, but we have four different vials that we're printing into with two different images, which is kind of crazy you can think about that. It's, it's really low power. We're only using one thing to make four different things. Which is great. You're just you're splitting light, and mm -hmm. you can do that mechanically. You don't have to have some sort of thing doing that. It's just a thing that sits there. Yeah, it's not multiple print extruder heads or anything like that. It's just a couple of glass optics in there. Um, and it's still all printing. Everything is going to print in 40 seconds or less with this. It is still cool. It's still <laughs> That's nuts. That's cool. Okay, projector, taken care of. Projector. And because you're splitting beams and moving the light in places it should be, check. Mm -hmm. Okay, the goo. The goo. The goo. Now, the goo, what I've seen before, it exists in a container, like a glass container with a lid. Mm -hmm. um, so is the goo in here, it's in a sealed container of sorts. Yep. But you still have to automatically post-process. Yes. So how did you take care of that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, so it's just these kind of glass files that we have that are open-ended. The goo that we're using is a very low viscosity material. I kind of explained this last time. It's, it's a material we can't actually print with on Earth super well because as it forms, it starts to sink or float. But what we're showing again in microgravity is like, that doesn't matter. Buoyancy is removed. So we're printing with this low viscosity material. Okay. It's in these glass files. And then basically the vials are capped on each end with like cones. And then what we do is we just push fluid through those cones. But we also design those caps to be removable. So when this is all done, we're still able to take this all apart and unscrew it and uncap it, and our parts are just going to be right there. Uh, spinning. You have to spin the thing, spinning. right? Yes. Spin the thing. So how did you solve that for four different things? Four. So we have these really smart kind of uh, what's called dynamixel motors um, on each vial. And then we have the special design in here that's almost like a drive shaft. So the, the vials gripped on kind of both ends with gears and rotated. So that makes it very stable and very strong torque. Um, which allows us to rotate them all very precisely, which is also cool that they each have their own motor because technically they're each independent systems too. So it's almost like we have four different printing systems in here in one. So why did you, and tell me if this is just stupid to ask or not, but you have one projector splitting the beam to get four different images. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you use one motor and some sort of transmission to gear up to all of them to spin at the same rate? Good question. Again, it comes into that push and pull of all the different size and like system requirements. So if we would have wanted to use a bigger motor, that would have been more weight. It would have added more complexity of how to connect them. So the, the tricky thing about the whole design of this machine that constantly happened, the push and pull is like, how can we make this as independent, rugged as possible while still keeping it low size, low weight, low power? And that's just the design that we ended up going to, is it, it was more efficient size and weight-wise um, to give each one a small little independent motor. Uh, I see some GoPros, four of them, yes. modified with a really nice Thor Labs lens on it. Is that right? Or Correct. Or is that a filter? That's a filter. So okay. each, each of these has a special, basically, GoPro that's been modified um, with these special lenses that will look into the vials. And the cool thing is, is we have basically these special LEDs that are red illuminated LEDs that are gonna shine into the vials while printing. And the way that works, it's gonna hit the part, it's gonna scatter, and it's gonna hit, uh, the light's gonna go into the cameras. We're actually gonna be able to reconstruct how the part forms in microgravity. Oh, that's kinda cool. And then the footage from these, are they saved on memory cards or? Correct. Oh, okay, so yep. when you recover what's printed, you can recover the footage of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And it, it comes back super quick. Uh, by the time we put it on the ship and get it back, it's only going to be like four or five hours. So That's it? Yeah, it just goes, it launches, we get it back same day, oh. unpack it, make sure everything's good. Um, I, I think that really shows just how powerful the system is. It just has such high turnaround. I mean, if it wasn't for the fact of like all this like space stuff, like this thing only needs two minutes to run. That's it. it, it Prints, post-processes, post-gears in a little more than two minutes. Well, and you've built it. There, there's four things going on here. At the end of the day, if you needed something, like I don't want to say a retail package, but, <laughs> but a retail package, you could have a single. You could have a, a, like a, a smaller single unit that does its thing. And that actually leads me to why? Well, I, okay, let me, let me qualify <laughs> that. So when we talked about 3D printing in space before, there's the famous NASA wrench. Mm -hmm. A lot of people printed that on their machine because it's a print in place design. You break off a little bit of support and you can wrench up and down to the size of whatever you need to adjust, mm -hmm. right? Tools in space makes a lot of sense. A 
goo printer <laughs> in space, what are the advantages of that? Yeah, I, I can kind of start of like why 3D printing in space in general first. So okay. if you're on a long duration mission to Mars, it's, you're gonna have to bring a lot of things with you. So basically things break on the space station and you don't know when or why. So you have a lot of these backups and spares. But if you're like, you know, millions of miles away on your way to Mars, you can't just send up a spare <laughs> if something breaks. So there's two things. You can there's either, no remote Walmart on the right? way to Mars, right? That would have been yeah. nice. So you can either bring just a ton of backups and spares of things you think might break, or you can bring a much more self-contained system and the raw materials you need to make those things. And that makes a lot of sense. And I've, I've preached that for a long time, like the, the, the way humans become a space species is through additive manufacturing. Yes. But for this though, and tools, like that makes sense. But the goo side, the goo, I mean, the goo can cover a lot. It can still do those tools. We can print really hard material. It can do really squishy material. It can do like O-ring and silicone seals. Oh. Uh, we can do specialized overprinting of things as well, because we can do that. And then that's, so I like to explain the, of two things it can do. It can do repair of cabin, like of your spacecraft, but it can also do repair of crew. So if you're in a medical emergency and you're on your way to Mars, this can print things like skin grafts. It can print things like dental crown replacements. It can print, you know, surgical, <gasps> Um, tools and surgical kind of wound closures. I it, didn't even think about it. Can, it can do so many different things. The, the idea of the, having the system with you on your way to Mars or Moon or wherever is to reduce the amount of risk as much as possible. And I think the system is really good at just covering a wide range of things that can do. That's cool. Just having, having, having more tools that give you that just-in-time thing that you need. Exactly. Oh, so along with the type of printers that can make, like, tools, like we think of FFF style machines mm -hmm. and, and the 3D printing of lunar regulate and, and that sort of thing. There's that, but also this complements those and it's just part of that added tool set that we'll need as a species to go to Mars and beyond. Correct, yeah, just it adds more capability onto the other capabilities that we need to, you know, make a spacefaring civilization to go out into the stars. That's cool. Did you ever think, like Taylor, tell me this, did you think Going to school, you would be working on a project that's going to help humans reach the stars. I, I can't say I did. What I can say is I, I went wherever thing I thought was the coolest and would have the most impact of like progressing people and kind of making humanity move forward. And it just so happens to be this awesome, cool project, and I'm so privileged and happy to work on it. I also want to say like this this project is not just me. Why why I may like kind of own it and run it. There has been tons of students that have worked on this, that have helped design it, that have put their blood, sweat, and tears um, to make this happen as well. And they, they deserve a huge shout out, and they've done so much for this. That's so cool, dude. Like, seriously, this, <laughs> like when we say space printer, like you, there's a certain connotation. But being able to talk to you and glean more information about like the, the mission and what you're trying to accomplish and what this means for the future, like this is, this is an integral part of getting us to the stars. And I hope, just, yeah. Like, I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. I'm in love and I don't care who knows it. Taylor, one thing before we kind of wrap this up, I really, can I pick this up and turn it sure, around? Go it for is it. hardened, right? Yes. I don't think people have ever seen a 3D printer with like a, uh, an IV drip bag or a blood bag or yeah, we, some sort of ba bag th on There's it. bags in it. That's how we like, contain our fluids. We have tons of like <laughs> clever off the shelf solutions we use to like contain our fluids and other designs and stuff. It, it's crazy. Yeah, the, this is where we'll have our isopropyl alcohol and our water and everything for using in our system. Well, it makes sense, right? Because you're, you're borrowing from medical tech. Okay, so it's, it's not an IV drip bag. It's not a blood bag. This is for isopropyl alcohol. No, no blood in the agents. system, yes. But yeah, there's, I, and that's what I've loved about working on this project is we just use so many clever solutions to things to, to make this all come together. And it's, it's been a beautiful project. And I think at the end, it's, it's just wonderful. Well, people are really gonna wanna know more about this, about it going up on Virgin Galactic, about how it was made and the people that worked on it. If this is available, just let them know. Point to that camera right there and tell them how cool this is. Yeah. Where they go to find it. Again, it's super cool. Um, you can go to our lab website, which has a lot of info on the past projects we did. Um, we have a GitHub link to the open source kind of software that's used on this project. We have a Discord to talk about this project as well. And then kind of as we analyze the results of this and get through this, there's going to be papers, there's going to be news articles. Um, and we'll make sure there's going to be videos. There's going to be great videos on it. Um, so we'll make sure they're kind of all updated on our lab website and things as well. So like keep up to date on this project. And this definitely isn't the last step for it. We keep miniaturizing it. We keep making it more space. Um, and I can say there's going to be some really more exciting aspects of it after this as well. There's things you're hinting at that you can't say, isn't there? There is. 
<laughs> With that in mind, I think we're gonna wrap it up right there. Thanks for watching. If you made this far, you're awesome. Don't forget to hug each other more, fight for a cause you believe in, and for the first time I get to say this, print all the things in space! <laughs> yes! And as always, high five. Ugh. T. L. Gray, hot.